We're lucky to have Mr. Joe Kearns here. He comes to us from Ames, Iowa. And this is a two for one deal. Where's Karen at? She in the back there. In the back. Stand up, Karen. <laughs> Wave your hand. Okay. Now she's not just a chauffeur down here. Uh, she's part of the organization that Joe runs and manages, and she's in charge of communications. And I went to talk to Joe, and she stepped right in front of me and gave me everything I needed, so I knew she was in communications. Yeah. Well, that's great. We're glad to have you. Uh, glad to have you part of our family here. She told me that she does communication and Joe does content. See, so I'd like to see a family that's divided like that. So, Joe comes to us from Ames, Iowa. His company is International Agribusiness Group. So, not just national, but international. That's correct. Been at it, both of them over 20 plus years. Works with hog units and other units with feathers. And we assume that's poultry. Somebody mentioned some ducks in that deal. Mm -hmm. Work with mill operators ingredient suppliers, packers, and you can see they all have some amount of risk. So help me welcome Joe and we'll get him started here. Right. Yep, we're, we're good to go here. Uh, the, the one part that he kind of left off was there should have been a comment, even academics will work with, so uh, enjoy that part of it. Um, I wanted to start this off because Dr. Henry was saying that uh, he likes to look at pigs and it's been advertised that I look like a pig. And so we'll just kind of get that uh, uh, rolling here. So uh, just kind of a little bit of background as I had the uh, honor and privilege of working with and for Mr. Jeff Hansen for the last 14 years uh, at Iowa Select. Prior to that, I was instrumental in the bankruptcy of, I of excuse me, Premium Standard Farms. Um, I really cut my teeth in Chicago working for Continental Grain when I was a floor trader down there, actually had a floor badge and really enjoyed that. And then the basal training came from uh, Archer Daniels Midland back in the mid 80s. And, and there's some significance to that about, about you know, whether you're a genera uh, generation Y or generation X is, is how you're skewed in your thinking depending on what era that you kind of had some influential training. And certainly my Archer Daniels uh, uh, side of it came around there. A little bit about IAG. It's uh, a, a functioning consulting group. There's uh, a spread across the country and across the world. Uh, uh, the important part, and I appreciate you bringing that up, is the international part. That flavor is going to permeate the balance of what we're going to talk about here for the rest of the day. Is it used to be that you, you, you were able to look around in, in uh, your backyard, your home state, or take a very regionalized view and pretty much come up with the answers? That, those days are gone. We're not there anymore. We're going to talk about that uh, for the rest here. Just two topics that we're going to cover, but we're going to do it rather, rather extensively. Is number one, when you have somebody that's talking about risk management, just what is risk management? Now, after we kind of get a definition of that, if we can all agree on it, we're going to go through a market outlook, uh, and I'll try to give you some practical applications of where we see opportunities and the whys thereof. So let's talk about this. So is risk management outguessing the market? Anybody think so? No, that's called being lucky when you're, when you're outguessing the market. No. Is risk management on occasion hedging a loss? What do you think about that? Yeah, we got some nodding heads up here. Absolutely it is. Let me give you an example. If, if you're in a market scenario that projects a $3 loss with a promise of a, uh, call it, uh, uh, let's call it right now, uh, the, the fall slash winter of 2010, but with a promise of $88 hogs come June, if you go to your banker and say, if I can just hold on and hedge a little bit of a loss now, I get this promised land later, is that risk management? Absolutely yes. And that ties into that third point there, is understanding the parameters. And this is becoming more and more and more important. I like to think of these commodity markets uh, as this swinging axe above your head. And as long as you duck at the right time, it's okay. It really is. And, 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 and the, problem is, the problem is, if you're not wearing a helmet, you're in trouble. The first time that you don't duck at the right time, you're done. And that's what's going to happen, I'm afraid, uh, to those that, that fail to properly put forth some risk management. 
Uh, the last one might sound a little bit esoteric here, and we could probably have a, a house divided, but, but if you lock in a static basis, I, and, I'm, and I'm making up a number here, if, if as producers you could sell two under the board for all your marketings on equal increments all year long, is that risk management? Absolutely yes. Absolutely. Let me give you another example of that. Did anybody have hogs hedged on the board coming into this fall but didn't have the basis covered? Now, nobody's going to want to raise their hand to that because, because what happened is basis widened out markedly. Now, it normally widens out coming into the fall, but this year it was much more significant than what it's been in years gone by. So what if you're willing to give up kind of some of these over bases that we get in the summertime? You might trade in one or two over in exchange for being two under in the fall. Is that risk management? And the answer is yes, because then what it allows you to do is sell on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange with absolute faith that you're going to be able to perform. Does that make sense? Give me a nod of heads of yes. All right, all right, we're going here. So when we talk about risk management, and I'm not going to get into too many of these, is there's four different categories that I kind of start to, to focus on that we put into practice. Now, I'm not talking about, let's talk about what risk management is not to me, and that's being actually in the barn, working with production, the, the per side of it. That's, that's not my reference when I function with uh, risk management. Risk management is actually margin management. We have income streams that, that we get our revenue from. we got a cost stream. And what we're trying to do is really narrow that gap. If, if the price of corn goes up commensurate with the price of hogs, do you really care? No. If it goes down, do you really care? No. What, we, what you're worried about is those things that are in between. And what we really focus on is what do we have control over? And that's in our commodity markets. It's the forward price and the revenue side. What we really don't have control over is any of these things. And so we try not to focus on those. My goal when I work with people is to get them to focus on things that you control. And, and if, you, if you wish to worry at night, go ahead and be my guest, but it's not going to do you any good. Let's focus on what we can actually do something about here. And kind of as a flow chart, the way that we put this together, is there's a lot of information that's in the public domain. We've got USD reports and a, and a lot of different entities with which you can form an opinion. And what that gets you is a lot of data and information. The tougher part is starting to get to this right side of the equation. Is truncate it down into the scope of my operation and what it means to me and where the bottom line is. And this is where we try to work with people and finally get to a point of execution. Does that make sense? All right. So when you take a look at this, here's, you know, it's kind of this constant push and pull. My buddy, uh, Mark Twain, uh, you statisticians would call this a type 2 error, reaching a conclusion that happens to be incorrect. Um, and and uh, the, the focus would be that this commodity pricing piece, where's the fulcrum? Because we've got all these forces at play. My contention is that that commodity pricing portion is taking on a much, much larger influence in your overall operation than perhaps it has. And, and, and I'm not going to say it's a replacement for health, a replacement for barn management, but certainly the influence is a little bit higher. Now, when we talk about risk management, especially in the pork industry, I don't want to lose perspective of this thing. We're a very, very unique industry. Because of the uh, Packers and Stockyards Act, we've got no accounts receivable. You get but which, by the way, uh, those cards, did everybody get one of those? Very important. This is a complete sidebar, by the way. Um, thank you. This whole gypsy ruling is, can I use the F word? It, it wants to make things fair. <laughs> And in this particular case, fair means the lowest common denominator for every party involved. That's what the goal is. It really is. So I, I'm, I'm a little bit passionate about this, where, where when we take a look at things and in, in what, that, what that proclamation is trying to do, it's really lowering it down to the lowest common denominator. And when you talk to the packing community, guess who's the big winner? They are. And you know what? They don't like it either. They fully understand that if those rules get implemented, they are going to make a ton of money for about two years, and then everybody in this room is broke, and they don't have any meat to move. They, 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 they've got idle plants, and our industry is completely decimated. That got a little too political for me, but that's, that's kind of the way I see it. We have no marketing departments. If you're Ford Motor Company, you better have billboards, you better have advertisements. You're in Time Magazine every week. Does anybody advertise in Time Magazine? Of course not. We've got no marketing department, and we've got no accounts receivable. And our major input and output of them, namely corn, soybean, meal, hogs, are completely fungible in exchange on a board of trade for years to come. This is a very unique market. Uh, one other opportunity that we have 
is those of us that are trading off of uh, uh, Iowa 7, Minnesota, whatever the marker is, you got a chance to feather your own bed. Anybody that's putting 100% of their production against some contractual provision, I, I think is losing an opportunity in order to mark up 90%. So, so let's just say, let's just say you, you, you contract 95% of your animals. That last 5% gets you the opportunity to leverage the price on the other 95%. Those are the type of things that we really, really need to be paying attention to. Now, I wanted to take this down from this esoteric of, of, of what is risk management actually into a, a tangible example. And I'm going to walk through this here about this is my idea of risk management here. So you've got a few assumptions, and I, and I did this. Which, by the way, it's very important that I give you dates. My goodness. Corn was limit down on Friday, almost limit up on Monday, down again on Tuesday, up just a little bit on Wednesday, and up another 18 cents today. This is incredibly volatile, so you almost got to pick your point, otherwise you're going to drive yourself nuts. But on this particular day, here is the scenario that we had. October hogs were trading right at $80. I could, uh, the, the calls were trading at 6 So a call is the right to purchase at a given price. Um, and when we take a look at corn, corn at that time in July was trading at 580. That call was at 63 cents, an $8 call was 18. So everybody got all these numbers? I'm going to work a little math here. Everybody okay with that? As a producer, if you make an assumption that, that I'm, and I'm using rough numbers because it makes the math easy, plus it comes out about right, that my cost of production is associated with about 10 bushels of corn per market animal. And I'm amortizing the south side, I, I recognize here. So if I take a look at this and say, hmm, what, what can I do here? If I was to sell this $80 call, I pick up $6 per hundred weight, how many hundred weights per animal? Roughly, two. How much do I get in my pocket per animal? Twelve dollars, exactly. So I pick up twelve dollars per pig, which if I divide that back out, remember I've, I've, I've got uh, ten bushels, so I've got an offset set and I'm, I'm at risk on corn. That gives me a credit of about a dollar twenty per bushel on corn. Does that make sense to everybody? So I've got twelve dollars per pig in my left pocket. Am I at risk at this point? Absolutely I am. So what am I going to do to mitigate some of that risk? Well, what if I sell, or excuse me, what if I buy this 580 call and sell an $8 call? The spread between those two numbers is 45 cents. I multiply that 45 cents times my 10 bushels that I need, and I just spent $4.50 of the $12 I took in. In this particular example, I am ahead by $7.50 per pig. Everybody got that math? Is this the perfect idea every single time? No, there is no such thing as perfect. There's some caveats associated with this. Um, for, for, for number one, I've got to margin my call that I sell. And so, and so therefore, I've got to have a banker that understands the scope of my production and what I'm doing. I've got to come up with the cash flow in order to pay for this one up front. And so there's a few little caveats, but let me ask you a question. How many times in the history have, once we made it to October, we've been trading at $80 on hogs. Anybody say zero? None, we've never done that. So is this, is this a real risky trade? And I'm effectively out at 86. Remember, I picked up six bucks, 100 weight, for the privilege of selling that. So, so I'm out of the market. If the market goes to 100, how much do I get on that pig? 86, 86. If the market goes to 100, what most likely has happened to corn? It's moving to, and I've given myself the spread between these two numbers, or about $2.20 times my 10. So I've got another $22 worth of opportunity. Does this make sense? And go through this, and I'll send this to anybody that wants it. But this is what risk management is when you boil it down, and, and you, you do the math, and you start working the numbers. All right? Okay. Is there a correlation between the price of corn and the cost of production? Yeah, I, I didn't run an R squared on this, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's very, very tight. Is there a correlation between the cost of corn and what you get for a pig? No, no, so the two different things, pay, pay attention to that. One is very tightly correlated, the second one has very little correlation whatsoever. This is where risk management comes into play. 
I'm going to start telling you a story about uh, a market forecast and where things are going. But first of all, it's a little history lesson. That, that was back in the good old days. Um, this chart runs from 1973 to 2005. Now, I've, and, and here's price activity in the corn market. I've, I've artificially put this blue line here at the bottom, and that's two dollars, and, and this this uh, blue line at the top at three twenty-five. The bulk of our trade for what's what's two thousand and five minus seventy-three is uh, uh, twenty-seven, right? Twenty-seven, thirty, yeah, twenty-seven plus thirty-two years. So thirty-two years worth of data. Most of the time, we stay connected within this relatively narrow band during that time. Now, we had some exceptions. This was in 74, the United States exported grain to the Russians, and so we had a little bit of a bump. Uh, in 83, we had a drought. I and mean, keep in mind what I was talking about beforehand. This is 1986. This is when I started grain trade. Anybody remember what those years were called? We had a program, a government program. PIC, exactly, the PIC certificates. Work. We got paid for the privilege of not by, of not producing corn, and so this is my first impression that corn always traded a dollar forty bushel. That's all I've ever known. So it was it was, it was quite the time here. Um, uh, a drought of eighty eight, uh, a flood of ninety three, and then in nineteen ninety five we had our first real breakout of this range, and that should have been our wake up call. That should have been the one that says we're not in Kansas anymore, although we really are right now. That um, uh, we're going to we're, we're in a new realm. But yet we fell back down and traded into a relatively narrow range in, until 2005, and that's all of a sudden when we had the advent of ethanol came into the market. And so as ethanol has created what used to be a ceiling in the market is now ostensibly a floor. What was once the top end of our range is now the bottom side. We had 2008, there was a bigger wake-up call than even what 1995 was, and here we sit today. Here we sit today. It wasn't an accident when I was talking about selling an $8 call. Are we in a 2008 environment right now? There's one huge difference. One huge difference. Anybody know what that is? It's the price of oil. We've got $82 oil instead of $140 a barrel oil. And that's the difference right now between $6 and about $8 a bushel. I've got a lot of confidence that you can sell that $8 call, and it's probably not going to get exercised. There's got to be a lot of world events that have to occur prior to you getting exercised on that $8 call. I'll tell you, there's a lot of world events going on right now, but they've got, they've got to hit some rhythm in order to get to that point. So for the next uh, half hour or so, here's what we're going to talk about. It's kind of in a market outlook. is these five points, and I've highlighted number three, because that's the key. That's the key to the next 18 months that we're going to go through is where are these acres going to come from. So keep that one in mind. So to start with is what in the world, and I literally mean what in the world, happened during our growing season. If you take a look at this, from May through July, this is uh, uh, the former Soviet Union. There's a lot of wheat grown in this area. It moves into the Black Sea, out through Istanbul, and into the Mediterranean. What do you, what's that look like? Looks like a great big drought, doesn't it? We've had, we've had very minimal moisture that created uh, uh, some production difficulties, eventually resulting in, in uh, uh, Vladimir Putin saying what? No more. I don't care if you got it bought. You ain't getting it. I'm not going to send it to you. And so we created, we created a dynamic in the marketplace that, that, says, that says we're running out of product. At the same time, now keep in mind, and I intentionally point this, this uh, uh, date out, that's June 30th of 2010. That, that correlates with this spike. Uh, Matif wheat is traded, it's the uh, French wheat market, it's traded in uh, uh, euro dollars per metric ton. This is, was our first hint to a corn producer in the United States that, that, that something is changing. This market took off on a roll and didn't stop for a little bit. It had to get to the point where finally somebody screamed, Uncle, you can have it back, I guess. And it took a little bit of time. Now, there's a significant thing that just happened to occur on June 30th. Does anybody remember what that was? We had a stocks report in the United States. You guys remember? That's been a little while ago. We had a stocks report that said we don't have as many stocks as what we once thought. That, that, that was just the spark that was, already, that, that was needed in order to, to light this kerosene that we saw on that previous slide of a drought in this situation. Now, at the same time that Russia is going through an incredible drought, what do we have happening in the Midwest? We've got a lot of rain, don't we? 
we got a lot of rain. During the same May August time frame, we basically got a year's worth of rain in a four month period throughout much of the Corn Belt. Now, your grandfather said rain makes green. Yeah, close enough. What we found out is rain makes incredibly dark green foliage across Iowa. It was a beautiful looking crop that didn't live up to its promises. While we had all this XX moisture, did anybody go camping this summer? And did you sweat if you did? Yes, you did. Our nighttime temperatures just never fell this summer. So we had two very unique scenarios going on. All this rain coming and the night, which normally would cool off the atmosphere, and then, and then these nighttime temperatures that just wouldn't go away. And so why, why are we disappointed in yields across much of the Midwest? Well, this is, this is probably why, is that corn crop had to use energy in order to shuck away moisture. All that photosynthesis that was occurring during the day was used to push moisture out of it rather than allowing the fruit, the kernel, in order to develop. Now, we didn't know that. So I imagine, I imagine if you're chopping silage, it had great yields. But as far as uh, uh, just green yields, uh, number two yellow, it was a little tough. That was combined with growing degree days because it was relatively warm. Our growing degree days were, were a little bit higher than normal, which is great because it means that you're not going to get an early frost that's going to kill you. Frost happened to be two weeks late this year. So we needed that extra growing season in hindsight, but we didn't get it. And so we had a crop that matured relatively quickly that wasn't ready, came out of the field wonderfully, uh, and, and all through October it was great harvest conditions. We ought to be happy. And yet we're trading corn at $6 and wondering what the price is going to go to. So this is a very interesting dynamic. Um, yields, yields is, number is going to come in about 155. If, uh, if I put that dot when we started the year, would you have said that's about trend line and it's not a big aberration? I mean, that's about right. That's about right. The problem was we needed a record crop just in order to keep pace with what the supply and demand is going to look like. At the same time that we've got the wheat market starting to catch on fire, the corn market starting to catch on fire, it, but if, you, if you're an industrial trader, if you've got fund money, if you're a New York banker that's got a lot of money at your disposal, now keep in mind that um, uh, July 1st is right about here, so, so ignore this right side just for a moment. What were the opportunities for return right in here? Weren't all that great, were they? So you've got all this money that you're sitting on, you don't know what to do. What caused this market to start, and I'm going to call that September 1st, starts to increase just a little bit. What was going on during the world just a couple months ago? Had a little consternation in Congress, didn't we? Looked as if that the Democrats weren't going to hold on quite as tightly. And with that, once we get gridlock in Washington, the world loves it. Because you know there's going to be no regulations that are foist upon you that are going to change the playing field. So we get a little bit more confidence. We get a little bit of a gap right here. What's that called? By the way, it happened on November 2nd. What was it? The election. What did it lead to? Obama grumpy pants. He was not happy here. <laughs> This, this dollar index is falling the whole time. Now, this is very, very important. This is going to be the key to the trade on the go forward. Because as the dollar weakens, it makes our products cheaper in everybody else's currencies. It makes our exports more competitive. That's why, that's why Ben Bernanke, you call it quantitative easing, call it printing money, whatever it is. As long as you're doing it, it's trying to help your economy. It's the only tool he's got left. We've got unemployment at 10%. We've got a health care system that's completely broke. What are you going to do? You've got to print money. But yet, notice what's happened here. We've kind of bottomed out and bumped up here a little bit. And, I, and if, if I was, I ran this chart, I want to say, on, on Friday before I came here. The last three days, the dollar's been generally higher. Why is that? Because the world looks at the United States and, and recognizes all of our problems and says, you guys stink. And we stink more. You've got Ireland that is going through a Greece-style bailout right now. The euro's in trouble. Everybody in Germany is mad because they're paying for, the, for, the, for anybody in Greece's retirements. What happens after we get Ireland squared away? Portugal. Portugal and Spain are the next two in line, exactly. And so that type of phenomena is starting to cause, as odd as this sounds, that the United States dollar is a safe haven. 
That's going to portend perhaps some difficulty in getting our markets to rally. These are very dynamic markets. I mean, as evidenced when, when I tried to, you know, recap the last five days trade, is we're up, we're down, we're sideways. The Chinese want in, then they want out. And then they say, no, we're going to, we're going to raise interest rates in order to cool off our economy. And then, oh, by the way, we changed our mind. We just bought Argentinian corn. I mean, we're, this is the type of environment that we're going to live in for quite some time. All right, so those same fund managers that had all this money laying around that didn't know what to do with, the Dow Jones at that point in time wasn't giving them any type of return, uh, which by the fund managers are in this yellow, this, this upper part is what are called indexed funds. And so it's like a mutual fund. It's just people throwing money into it and it's perpetually long. The hedge funds can go long or short. What did they do on or about the 1st of July? They were short, they bought up. That's the wheat market. Corn market, what were they? They're about even where they just started buying. Same thing on soy. So all this money is coming into the market, and it shouldn't be a huge surprise that when I take a look on or about July 1st, what did the corn market do? It's going to run. We've got all kinds of money flowing at this market. We had a crop report that came out on October 8th, and gapped is higher because we knew we were going to completely run out of corn. And then it fell back down again. We've closed the gap. Technically, technically closing the gap what was an important part for a bear. For somebody that wants to be selling this market, you had to close that gap because it proves that the market could regress to that, stay, uh, to that point. If we would not have closed that gap, it was incredibly bullish chart formation. Incredibly bullish. The fact that we did, all it means is we're, we're still in the land of quandary right now. So December th uh, 2010 corn has kind of reached a point where it just doesn't know. And it's going to bounce around and we're going to be characterized by this volatility. When we start taking a look at, at uh, planting, con excuse me, growing conditions of wheat, this is the month of October, because we had no moisture uh, across much of the heartland here uh, when, it, when it came to precipitation, it also meant that we had no moisture in Kansas uh, when it comes to some wheat development. Whoops. And at the same time, that we had relatively warm temperatures that are trying to mitigate out some moisture. That is going to be a concern. We've had moisture that's moved through over the last several days. It's going to help out. Uh, whether it's too little, too late, I don't know. So those first two bullet points is what happened during our growing season and what happened to this abundance of crop. We've kind of covered those. We had the vagarities of the world growing conditions as well as just this aberrant situation that we had in the United States of incredibly looking fields that just didn't give us any kind of yield. All right. Switching gears here, we're going to talk about this whole planted acres game. So as a recap, what are we looking at in 2010, this past year that we just had, versus the year before? And the big loser last year was the wheat acres. We were down roughly 5 million acres. I want to tell you that in 2009, we didn't want to be for 4.83 million acres lower. What happened? Especially in eastern corn belt. Anybody, anybody remember? That's right. It was very, very wet. They couldn't get the acres in. And so because of that, these other crops kind of pirated from the wheat acres. Wheat wanted to go back in, and I'll tell you what it did. Wheat acres have already been planted. They're, they've already taken their lot. When it comes to cotton, cotton had been our whipping post for a while. I'll just show you in a moment. Cotton, cotton's standing up and fighting back right now. And that leaves a corn-soy battle that is going to be of epic proportions from now until the growing season gets started. And then once the growing season gets going, it's going to be even more important. When you take a look at the crop acres, um, once we hit below, here's, here's your key inf inflection points. Anything below a billion bushels of carryover in corn is tight. Anything below about 300 million bushels, 250, excuse me, million bushels of soybeans is tight. Before we've had a single planter roll, before we had a significant snowstorm across the entire Midwest, the projections for next year's carryouts, not this year, we're just getting off of, are inexorably tight. When you take a look at what the income side of it does, take a look at this red line, this cotton has just shot through the moon. And I'll, and I'll get to that in one moment here. Uh, corn, these are, these are layered on months. This, is, th th this was on Friday, and then I just regressed back to 30 days. Is take a look. The front end of the corn market has jumped. Uh, and I can't even read that. that was, this is June. That's today. So the front end has jumped where the back end hasn't reacted quite much. And this is going to be key. 
Because everything that I'm setting up for you is telling you how tight we're going to be next year, and yet the market perception is, ah, I think we'll wait and see, and I think that's going to be a huge mistake for those that don't cover themselves. Here. Uh, the world's appetite for corn, we haven't been able to produce ourselves away from it. We will eat whatever we produce. The only question is price, but we, we are not, uh, we don't have world surpluses of corn right now. Weed is a different animal in, in that it doesn't like to cross species very well, except for the feed side of it, mind you. We have specific applications for our wheat, and wheat has done its job. It has taken that same time that that motif took off and skyrocketed the prices where those that can plant winter wheat or could plant winter wheat have done so. Those acres are done. Now, can you double crop behind some or rip them up if necessary? Yes, you can. But what's, gonna t what's it going to take for you to rip up wheat ground? High prices. That's the only reason that you're going to do it. So we're starting to paint ourselves into a corner. The cotton one is kind of interesting to me, is that uh, this dip represents 2008, and then that's the, the, the domestic usage. And there's a reason for this. What happened in 2008? General economy. How was it? Kind of stumped, didn't it? Wasn't too good. Wasn't too good. Did you have to replace your fruit of the looms in 2008? If you were in college, how long could you go without replacing your fruit of the looms? Yes, 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 yes. But that can only last so long. Food stuff is one thing, but these consumables is, is a different thing. And this is what we've seen, is we backed off cotton demand to a certain degree, and suddenly it has come roaring back to the point where this chart goes, by the way, back to 1961. It's as far as back as I could pull data. We have never traded cotton this high in the modern era, with the exception of the Civil War. The Civil War is the only time we've traded cotton this high. So if you can plant cotton, are you going to do so? You better believe you're going to, and the acres are going to reflect that. When we take a look at this corn supply, now this is, this is uh, we are impossibly tight on our carryouts. Anything below a billion bushels is snug. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to draw your attention down to this ending stocks line. And here we go, this is the November report. And so the USDA says we're going to have 827 million bushels left at the end of this year. Okay, fine. Next year, it's, it's lower than that, before a planner rolls. Is there any risk premium in this market right now? No, there's not. And I'll show you a chart of December 11 here very, very shortly that's going to give you that indication. The long and the short is we have a corn situation that we're waiting for somebody to raise their hand and scream, Uncle, I give up. Is it going to be the pork industry? If you get $88 hogs trading in June today, which by the way they are, is anybody going to pull the plug? No, they're not. They're not. The beef side of it, have we already basically put in stone whatever it's going to be? And the beef cycle's long enough that whatever, whatever amount of cattle we have on feed or going to be on feed are already physically on the ground. It's going to have to be the poultry side for, from a domestic consumption. Who owns, who owns Pilgrim's Pride right now? JBS. Yeah, they got a little bit of money. And they want market share. Who are they fighting? Tyson. They want market share. So you've got this poultry side that is just at loggerheads with one another, neither of them willing to give an ounce, and at the same time, our ethanol industry is making money, and I'll get to that. When you take a look at yields, we've got, we had five analog years where from August to September we fell. Two of those, here they are, 1995 and 1996, we also fell uh, from October to November, and, those, and in those two years that appear to have the same trend of what we're experiencing this year, they continue to get lower. So this final report that we get in January, is there much hope that there's going to be some la la moment of, of we found that we found the bushels? Probably not. Probably not. So there's not a savior on the horizon from the supply side to get us there. Um, as I said, this gap filled on Tuesday. Does that represent a significant? We, we are trading. We are trading DC11 corn at about four dollars and ninety cents on Tuesday. What is that great buying opportunity? It sure, looks, it sure looked like it right now. It sure looked like it right now, and I believe it's going to be in the future. Now, I don't, I don't think that you can just run headlong by two years worth of production at that and, and just think that you're fat and happy and not going to do anything else. There's got to be within some structure of what I was referencing before and a little bit of stratification of this to make sure that your financial interests are protected, that the bank's financial interests are protected, and that you've got the production behind it. 
here. Switching to our friend ethanol, ethanol production continues to move higher and higher and higher. And why not? They're in the black. They're in the black. Is there any motivation whatsoever for an ethanol producer to back off his production? No, they're making some money. You don't blame them here. More and more of our corn crop continues to move towards ethanol. This blue line represents animal feed. The red line is our ethanol usage. We're almost in an apex where we're going to cross those numbers over one more time. I mean, essentially, we're at a 50-50 split right now. That ethanol's taking half of our corn crop, and that the production, or excuse me, a feeding is taking about half, and then export comes in for another. It's, it's about 40%, 40%, 20% if you do all the math, the, the way that it all works out. The point is, is that in a, in a few very short years, is, is we have given up our mantle of being king of corn in the feeding industry, and now we have to share that with somebody else that doesn't play very fair sometimes. If we fed absolutely no more, by the way, I'm not trying to pick on, on uh, the DDG market. This is officially what the, what the USDA calls DDGs. I'm not making this up. And I think it's a hint to society. Um, but if, if we were to feed no more, our exports would have to bump up about 150,000 tons a month, right about here. And so far they have. And guess where we're all going? To the Chinese. The Chinese know that as soon as they come to the United States shore and start buying physical corn, it's going to tip their hand and the market's going to go sky high. So all fall, they've been buying DDGs, putting them in the barges, rolling it down the Mississippi River, starting in, in northern Iowa, and loading it out in the Gulf. Is there a problem with that long term? How well is that going to work in January? It won't. We're in a transition phase right now. We're in a transition phase. For those of you, do you have any Northeast Iowa producers in here? I don't know where the... Anybody, an Iowa producer is going to be impacted, perhaps more pronounced, uh, in a more pronounced fashion than anybody else because that, that export market is on its way out the door. All right. Trying to get everything kind of on an even keel. When we take a look at, at uh, uh, harvested corn, corn area, per country. When you're in South America, you're talking about hectares. Obviously, we talk about acres. So what I've done with this chart is try to get it all on an even keel and just kind of call it acres. So here's the United States is the orange line. The Chinese are the green line. I want to see the Brazilians are this line. But just kind of get that thought in your head about here's where the acres lay out. Here's where the yields lay out. And so even though the Chinese were pretty snug with us when it comes to arable land and what they're producing as far as macro acres, their yields are pathetic. When you multiply the yields times the area, the discrepancy just gets wider and wider and wider. Toward the United States is the king of corn. The Chinese, in essence, whatever they grow, they're going to consume. They're not, going, they're not a threat to our export markets, but we are it that the world is coming to the United States for corn. That's not so with beans anymore. We, we, we're about a 50-50 split in North America to South America. Here's the real take-home message on, on, on where the acres have to come from. We need to get prices high enough in the country's currency that has the arable land mass in order to incent them to open up that land. Does that make sense? And it doesn't happen in U.S. dollars when we have, remember that chart that shows the value of the dollar declining markedly? What the impact of that, now keep in mind, so take a look, the green line is against this uh, first y-axis uh, over here. And so when you take a look, is soybeans to the, United, to the American farmer worth about $12 a bushel? If you're a Brazilian farmer, it's only worth about $7 a bushel, equivalent in your currency. Is that enough incentive to make you say, yippee skippy, I'm opening up every single pasture ground I can find and let this thing roll? Probably not. The second factor is that the interest rate environment in South America is characterized by double-digit inflation. Is if you go borrow money in, in uh, uh, Brazil or Paraguay or Argentina, you're probably paying 13% plus or minus. So, so not only does it have to get to absolute values, but we've got to account for inflation also. That's the struggle of the market. And the market has to move in absolute higher prices in order to get there. Does it necessarily mean that prices go higher in the Chicago Board of Trade? No, no it doesn't because we can have currency revaluations and a whole bunch of other things. What's the most likely scenario? Prices go higher in the Chicago Board of Trade. And that's kind of what we're looking at. So, 
in answer to point number three, where will those acres come from? Is uh, we're going we're to have a fight on our hands uh, come this spring, and, and fertilizer prices and everything else are going to play a role. But the major work is going to be done between the relationship between the price of corn and the price of beans, and they're going to be butting heads constantly on this here. Uh, there is no secondary crop. Once we harvest the United States crop, that's it. Uh, South America has had a little bit of dryness uh, as we look. Just real quickly on the soybean supply and demand. Again, once we get below 300 million bushels or so, it's snug. When you take a look down here at this ending carryout, we're at 185. That's very, very snug. Taking a peek over about what does next year look like, you're still in this 200 million bushel plus or minus. We're, we cannot grow ourselves out of a problem in one year. One year. We lost 1.8 billion bushels worth of production with the Russian drought. We can't make it up that quickly. The second side of it is, if, if, if you are an importer from Russia and they've kind of given you the thanks but no thanks, what are you going to do with your, if you're Egypt, what do you do with your stocks as soon as you have an opportunity to increase them? You increase them. Exactly right. That's all importing countries are going to raise their buffer. We're in an inflationary environment for the, for the next three years to come or so. Uh, when you take a look at, at the USD balance sheets, I'm going to back up there just one moment here, is this export number right here jump from October to November by 50 million bushels. That's a significant jump, and it's all on account of Chinese. We are sending more beans to China than ever before in history. This top line is what the USDA says we're going to stop at. Uh, with some production issues that we're having in Argentina, it would appear as if the Chinese are going to be on our shores for quite some time. Soybeans, again, that, that uh, June 30th or July 1st time frame is very, very significant, is they jumped up and are trying to do their job. They cannot lose ground to, to uh, the corn crop, and they're trying not to do so. So that fourth bullet point is how do we physically move things into, into position here. It's if you are an export, I don't care if you're in the Pacific Northwest or the Gulf of Mexico, you're taxed right now. You, you are loading as fast as you possibly can, and you can't do it any faster. And the world continues to come to our shores asking for more and more product here. Uh, a little bit of hint to our ethanol friends is they have a, a, uh, a marker in the biodiesel industry that is characterized by negative margins. We've operated for almost an entire year in the biodiesel industry without a renewal of the credits. On December 31st of this year, if we do nothing, the ethanol subsidy goes away. This is going to be a very interesting dynamic. We've had, we've had the shift of the shift of the House. It's going to be, I, I don't know how it's all going to play out. I don't know how much political clout the farm state senators are going to have versus those that come in, come in uh, new to Congress with a mantle of, my constituents put me in here to say no to everybody. I don't know how that's all going to balance out. I really don't. Um, the Chinese are the answer to the entire soybean uh, market. Their use continues to go sky high, and hence their imports do also as their production stays relatively steady. Uh, the increase that we've seen for the last 15 years in South America basically superimposes over top of the Chinese increase in demand. That shouldn't be a huge surprise, and that's where it's going. Unlike the corn situation, though, where we've got a huge running head start as far as yields, when we take the top three producing countries in soy, it's about the same. It's about the same. All of our yields are relatively in parity with one another. And so again, when you, when you multiply out the land mass times the yield, is the United States by itself uh, is king. However, if you combine the two South American countries that are the major soy uh, producers, they are going to usurp the United States production. So that's why we have this, this uh, bi-hemispheral kind of rotation. It's a six-month market in the soy, whereas it's a 12-month um, market on the corn. I bring this up just for a little geography lesson. I'm going to show a picture of, of what weather looks like right now in Argentina. This little dent right here is significant. So here's Uruguay, here's Argentina, here's that little same dent. We've got drought areas throughout much of Argentina that are very, very concerning. They're scheduled to get some rain over the weekend. Uh, hopefully they do. The weather forecast models look as if they do. The point is, is that no matter whether they get the rain or not, is that their crop is slower in development than what they would like. And remember that chart I just showed you a little bit ago about Chinese imports? It's going to keep the Chinese on our shores later into the spring than what we're accustomed to. How many excess beans do we have in the United States? Not very many. Not very many. It's going to be very, very interesting dynamics. 
Shifting gears here just a little bit um, uh, to our favorite topic is pork production uh, has kind of uh, plateaued out there. Domestic side of it, we're just not eating too much more than what we once were, and as we produce more, that's why these imports, uh, or excuse me, our exports continue to increase. Our friends in the poultry market, I think, have a little bit more concern. Just take a look at what this domestic consumption of chicken has done over the last few years. We've stuffed you guys full of about as much chicken as you're going to take, or so it may appear here, and we want to produce more and more and more. This could be, this could kind of be a millstone around the neck of the pork industry if we're not careful here, depending on uh, uh, competitiveness. Fifteen years ago, as I was talking earlier, Brazil showed us that they could produce corn, and, or excuse me, produce the soy market. They can also produce chicken, <coughs> as well as hogs. Uh, uh, China is the absolute king of hogs. Their production is moving, moving uh, much, much higher. This soybean meal production in order to feed them is a little deceiving because keep in mind, you, you can produce soybean meal from imported beans, and that's exactly what they're doing. So they're trying to get self-sufficient in their industry in order to feed their, own, feed their own industry with the grain side. Can you ever be self-sufficient if you're importing anything? Mm -mm, you can't. So they might not want to import our pork, but by importing our soybeans, they're still in that same hostile, captive market, and they don't like it one little bit here. Um, the hog market made a lot of money for a lot of years. And that's what's really induced this evolution into the market. Wall Street finally caught on that, that you know, probably at, the, at this time, I'm going to make up a number here, your, your cost to produce a hog might have been 100 bucks or so. And, and so when you're starting to see uh, these type of returns, they decided they wanted a portion of it. And this is what we've seen as far as the, uh, the number of, of uh, U.S. hog producers. We, we finally stopped getting data in, in, in uh, 2001 because you can put all the hog producers in the room and they can count them well easily. It didn't, it didn't matter anymore more. Um, the breeding herd has finally started to fall off here after some productivity gains have necessitated it. This is what the United States looked like. The Canadian herd took a little while longer, but they're starting to roll over based on some economics. So, so not only do we have uh, fewer producers, we also have fewer animals. Stay with me on this one because this is what this is at that point in time what the United States looked like, and the numbers really haven't changed too much, is in the United States we have 0.3% of our producers giving us about 55, it's actually about 60% of our animals. Got that number in your head? 0.3% give us 60%. Here's what China looks like. Which, by the way, our 75,000 farms would get lost in the rounding in China. You wouldn't even notice it. If you, if you took, took, take them or leave them, they can't tell the difference. But take a look at what we've got here. That, that of these that produce one to nine pigs per year constitute about the same amount as the larger farms uh, in the United States. So this is, it's, it's a table of two, it's two industries that, that perhaps couldn't be at any more opposites here. So when you take a look at production, obviously uh, China is king just with all their numbers, followed by the EU, the United States, that's pork producing. Our pork exports, however, is, is the United States and, and the EU kind of battling it out. I'm throwing Canada kind of into this North American production with Brazil picking up some residual. Who in the world's importing China pork? If I give you a pork chop that said made in China, Who's eating it? Now, uh, your, your tires were probably made in China. There's some things that, that we can kind of go along with, but there's other things that have a cultural significance that I find it very, very interesting. Um, the point is, is that our exchange rate, what I was visiting about before, if our dollar wants to rally specifically against the, the European Union's currency, the euro, this is going to make the European Union much more competitive for exports. So we're dependent upon exports. We're 20 plus percent of our production goes to export, and I'm a little concerned about that. <coughs> Where is our product going here? Japan, Russia, Mexico are kind of the big ones there. Um, uh, and as long as, as long as we're keeping those customers happy, we're okay. A little bit of hope. For, for the animal agricultural industry, if we could ever get some of these countries to adopt uh, the type of diets that we see in the United States and add to their prosperity as they grow, uh, certainly the demand is there. And we are a low-cost producer of protein in this nation, and I don't see that changing anytime soon here. I got a kick out of Dr. Dreets when he's talking about, uh, about what's our motive. We should be having lower and lower and lower carcass rates, but what do we do as an industry? <laughs> Higher and higher and higher carcass weights. We're at absolute record carcass weights right now. Now there's a couple reasons for it, so we're not going to pick on, um, on producers too much. What, what happened basically in the middle of September? We transitioned into new corn. 
Yeah. What was the difference between old corn and new corn? Was it a great big chasm? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we had a little bit of excess space in barns. Our, our, our marketing numbers up to that point had been about 4% lower, so we had the barn space that was available, and now we've got this great corn that's moving through. And so this isn't a huge surprise that we took off. The surprise is we can't catch up. We, we can't get ahead of this market. And that's why anybody watching futures, the December market is, again, under pressure today. Is we've got too many. We've got just as many animals coming to market as we did a year ago, and every single one of them weighs more than what it did a year ago. Our pork production is going to be up for the, for the uh, third and potentially the fourth quarter here. Uh, the USDA numbers kind of take a where, where is our industry going here. Uh, I was talking earlier about chicken. We're on a slugfest just for market share in that particular one. Beef, all those animals are already on the ground. Take a look what we're, what we're forecast to do in pork. is actually moved just a little bit higher. So during a time when, when grain prices are moving higher, the ethanol industry isn't showing the blink, and, and with the lower dollar values is that our exports, the, we want, the world wants our corn. Something's not going to add up. So, there's a movie coming out, by the way, and maybe it's already released where the two trains are coming at each other. What's it? I don't know what it's called, but, but, but when, I think about, when I think about the corn market, this is what we're looking at is the two trains are heading at one another. And I hope somebody throws a switch here uh, someplace back there. So what are the profi uh, prospects for profitability? I am most concerned with the input management side, and that's the green side. Uh, specifically on corn, specifically the December 11, I think offers a great opportunity. Uh, uh, as soon as China sneezes, the entire world seems to catch a cold right now. Today, today it's not China, today it's Ireland. Ireland's the big trouble, uh, and the Germans are still mad at everybody for having to bail them out here. Uh, volatility is going to be the, the absolute norm. I share, I share this slide from a producer's perspective in that, in that the, the margin in the packing industry has been absolutely pronounced. It's, it's been huge. Somebody was up here talking earlier about the success of the Triumph plan. It's been hugely successful. Whether it was by design or lucky timing, it doesn't matter. The money's just as green. They've been hugely successful, as is anybody that is, uh, that's involved in the packing industry. And just, I toss this out rhetorically, how long can that last? We have an aging infrastructure in our, in our packing, packing plant capacity. Uh, uh, those of you that have, that have been through some of these facilities, they've still got the same linoleum they had on the floor in 1963. It's green and it looks like you take a step back in time. We've got some aging infrastructure. Is it time, is it, is it time that producers participate in some of this? Whether you write a contract that says, you know, what I was referencing earlier, as part of the CME or part of the meat, or own a piece of a packing plant yourself, that would seem to be, to me, from an economic side, to be a logical conclusion here. So a take home from this whole, this whole thing, China is going to take center stage. We just, we, are, we, we cannot, we, they've, they've got 20% of the people in the world and 1% of the world's liquid energy. Think that's trouble? They have to import two thirds of their energy in a liquid form. Something's going to give. They're, they are going to be a force to be reckoned with. The second thing is we've got this biofuels policy. It's going to come down to uh, Washington politics versus a Main Street reality. And, and, and the Main Street, I'm calling those of us that are, that are dealing with corn on a day-to-day -day basis, our fobbing capacity, or our export capacity, I should say, our ability to physically put things into vessels and give them, and give them to other countries is being taxed like never, ever before. Uh, volatility. Last five days, is just, it's just a little... Yeah, you can pick out any five days. It just happens to be that this conference hit, uh, and, and it's going to continue along those. So again, from, from my buddy Mark Twain, it ain't what you know, it's what you think you know, but it just ain't so. Uh, with that, the official CFTC disclaimer, disclaimer that says, uh, I gotta do this. I, I, I've got to do this because it's Series 3 license, and it's making sure I might be making all this up. I, mean, I might. Uh, uh, for those, uh, with that, I would take any questions whatsoever, if we have time. Yeah, if we have to, okay. Yeah, five minutes or so. Tough questions, right over here. Yeah, this has to be, let's say, the next currency that more of the trade, more of the recent states, you get a price bill, like, going around the world. Is there any kind of uh, regulation out there for the battle that's going to happen over corn? Or does 
somebody come on and say, okay, we got to stop Dr. Parathenol, put it to the human, to the feed side, you know, to the food chain, or they just got to let it the markets dictate who's most dollar to take Okay. The, the, the question is, what happens if we hit a drought this next growing season? Is there a provision that allows somebody with logic in Washington to say, stop the music on ethanol or uh, of whatever it may be? Uh, it's actually worse than that. It's actually worse. Lisa Jackson, the head of the EPA, the one that gets to regulate all this, has emphatically stated, I will not let the price of corn dictate our policy on ethanol. It's worse. It's worse, th it's worse than thinking about, okay, I'll take it into consideration. It's no, I will not. And sending a clear message to the market that, that, that no matter what the circumstances are, she is going to follow what she sees to be her mandate to not only 10%. Not only now, this is something we didn't talk about. This is something we didn't talk about. We've got a 10% mandate with a 15% allowance. There's a spread here. We can use 50% more ethanol than what we currently are, and the, and, and the administration's goals are to do exactly that. It almost seems like they're taking a blind eye to what, would, what to me at least, is, is logics and economics in a, in a whole world situation where you've got un, unemployment trading at 10%. You know, what, how in the world is running the price of energy or running the price of food much, much higher going to impact what to me is, is really kind of the macro issues driving it? So uh, it, it's, it's worse than is there a mechanism? The answer is no. And she's come out the other way and said, I'm going to do it whether you like it or not. What about physical ownership uh, for Mexico? I think soybean is probably the biggest issue for a lot of our producers. And just being able to get access to soybean, you know, we had problems a couple years ago. Right. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Kokash's question is, is, what about physically availing yourself to, to product? Right now, and, and, and the specific question was the soy market, right now the soybean meal market has zero friends on the export side. Keep in mind what I was talking about there earlier, is China wants the beans. Why do we want the beans? Because they're crushing to pull the meal to the livestock sector, and then they're taking the oil and feeding their people. And so while, right now, if you're a Cargill or a Bungie or an ADM and you own a processing facility, it's, you're breaking even at best. It's a tough gig. And so if, as, as pork producers, we want to say, we want soybean meal, they're going to go fine with me, but you've got to compete with the Chinese for the beans that I'm going to have to pay in order to bring them into my plant and crush them for you. It's a very real concern. Statistically, we, we didn't run out of beans two years ago. From a practical standpoint, we really did. We had to borrow from the, from the, the next year crop just in order to make ends meet. Uh, uh, soybean meal basis right now is very, very wide. I think I think it's going to continue to stay wide. Uh, but if, if you could book these, uh, I'm, I'm picking a, a kind of a central United States number, 20 under FOB, the processor, and book that forward, I would be taking advantage of that. I'm not sure how many are going to allow you to do that. You can probably do it through the first quarter of 2011. Take, uh, I don't know. Uh, do we have, do we have no, I'm not going to do that. If we had wireless, I'd pull up what, what the quotes are trading. Just trust me on this one, is that the soybean meal market is absolutely dead level flat. There is $330 plus or minus from now to the end of July, and then, it, and then it falls off. I really like the fall off. I really, really like that fourth quarter, because fourth quarter is trading at about a $30 discount to the nearby. So roughly $330 nearby, $300 bucks for, the, uh, for the fourth quarter. I like, I like that. Right here, here. One more. Okay, question there. Um, you first started off talking about that corn that uh, you sell a main dollar call uh, on the, was it October corn? Uh, that was actually July corn. July corn? Yes, sir. That you didn't say that that would be, you thought that was the same chance of the you know, that you'd gone through all the rest of this, you know, the corn, all the gel and everything out there. Uh, you know, all of those with you was the, yeah. Yeah. Do I need to go back to the disclaimer? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
your, your question is a good one, and the question is, is when I started off my talk, I was, uh, one, of the, one of the concepts I provided was the purchase of an at-the-money call and a sale of an $8 call, and, and gave you that I think it's relatively safe. The answer to your question is the month. Is you've got two things working. You've got price and time. That July call rolls off on or about June 22nd, and so whatever damage, whatever market, whatever market movements are going to happen between now and then are the only ones that influence. My biggest concern is what happens to the 2011 crop. And so, and so our current economic situation with $82 crude doesn't support $8 corn. Now, now your, your, your point could be, yeah, but what, you know, could crude go to $140 a barrel again? I say, yes, and then at that point in time, then it would. So, again, when we're trading options and when I'm talking about risk management strategies, none of these are absolutes. Because if they were, nobody would ever pay you the 18 cents for the $8 call if they were absolutely sure that it, that it wasn't going to go higher. The point is, is that you've got to pick your numbers, make sure they work for your cash flow, for your risk profile, and then, and then put them into play. So I do see a lot of, uh, a lot of price spike, a lot of volatility coming into this market. The, the, the corn trade that I gave you is a net long volatility. And I, I, I get into the math some, after this conference if you want to visit about that, but, but, but how the math works. There's a, there's a whole Black and Scholes regression model laying behind there to price these things out that's way over my head mathematically that I can kind of uh, function through it. But your long volatility in a market that I think is going to be characterized by increased volatility. So with eighty-two dollars oil, how high is it going to go? Like where, where the, where the like That's a great question. Now, now part of the, part of the answer, and the question was was at eighty-two dollars oil, how high can we take corn prices? In the absence of a subsidy for ethanol, we're there. We can't go any higher. Because the discretionary blending at that point in time would completely wipe out all the economics. With, if we were to, to uh, perpetuate this 45 cent a gallon, you can move up another dollar 26 a gallon from where we are right now. So let me use rough terms. So from 575 up to seven dollars before anybody even flinches. Now seven dollars to eight dollars starts to get a little bit tougher, and that's why instead of saying, hey, I'm willing to take this one and sell the $7 one, I'm giving myself a little buffer because I can see what I can, I can see in my mind what it would take to get us to $7. That next dollar gets, gets incrementally harder and harder to harder. Keep, keep in mind that, that we're trading these things on, on, on an asymptote, that the price is going to get higher and higher and higher and, and, and never touch, but that means as soon as we loosen something up, that you don't have to loosen it up very much and the price comes the other way. So again, it's this double-edged sword that's swinging above your head and you've got to learn how to duck at the right time or put on a helmet, one of the two. Okay, let's get in my head.